<clears throat> I would love to uh, pray, and we're going to get started uh, continuing, actually, the life of Elisha. And so, Father, this morning we want to come, and, and we are in a, a setting where we're, we're hearing a lot, and it's easy to reach super saturation, and yet we want to hear from you. And so I'd ask that as you speak by your word and through your spirit, you'd open our hearts as well to receive from you what you have for us, and that your word and life uh, would serve this purpose as in our lives of transforming us and leading us on in victory and in faith as your people. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, we left off yesterday in the life of Elisha. We're kind of flying over the life of Elisha. And we are in the ancient Near East where a symbol is a sermon and names have meanings and all kinds of rituals and offerings and all kinds of different actions are taking place and prophets are acting out their messages and um, this is what's happening in the life of Elisha and, and so as we started uh, yesterday with the life of Elisha we saw that even Elisha's name had a meaning and perhaps you can just shout out because I'll ask a couple of different things from the beginning just to get our heads back in what we were talking about yesterday can anybody just shout out where you're sitting, the name, the meaning of the name Elisha? Thank you, my God is salvation. And, and as we went into the first segment of the story, we saw that there was a symbol, and the symbol was uh, an actual item which was given to him, which he later had to pick up, and that was a cloak. And, and the message of the cloak that seems to come through not only in this story, but in the greater arc of Scripture is... Can anybody shout that out? It's all about with God. It's all about receiving. Thank you. Very difficult to uh, accept that sometimes, but true. Um, then we moved on to his, his story where he went home and he took his 12 yoke of oxen and he, he slaughtered them and he gave ox sandwiches to all his family and friends. And, and the message of the ox sandwich or or feces, if we want to do that version, because that's how, what it all ended up as. Thank you. Jesus is better. Better than what? Who cares? Jesus is better, even if life is hard, even if there's 10 years of nothing, or seemingly nothing, even if life is not looking like a highlight reel, it's still worth it to be on the road with Jesus, and he doesn't waste his time, and he doesn't waste ours. And now we're actually going to skip over a story, because we, we don't have time to go into every single one of them in the hours that we have. We're going to skip over a story in which Elisha encounters a number of barriers, and, and the message of those barriers is actually going to turn out to be something that's going to stand him in good stead for the rest of his life. The message of those barriers is just this. Where God calls you, he enables you. And so if God calls you into something, he enables you. He gives you the perseverance that is necessary. He gives you the resources that are necessary. He gives you the capability that is necessary. He empowers you to do what's necessary. Where God calls you, he enables you. And we're going to skip that story and move into the first event that takes place in Elisha's life after Elijah is taken up into heaven. And this story is about a hopeless situation. We, we probably remember the story of Joshua fighting the battle at Jericho because it's a very well-known story. And I always think of the story as, uh, you know, they march around, the city's destroyed, and then I kind of move on to the next story in my mind. But there's actually something that Joshua does at the time that they conquered Jericho, which is really weird. At least it sounds weird to me. Because um, he curses the place. After they conquer Jericho, he curses it. And you can read about this, whoops, excuse me, you can read about this in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. 
It says, Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. In other words, after Joshua conquered that city, he said, you know what, this place is damned for destruction and lifelessness. It's damned, it's cursed, it's doomed. And that is how it's going to be in this little city from now on. Why did he do this? I don't know. <laughs> Historical narrative. This is what happened. Uh, did God want him to do this? Well, I have no idea. What did God think of it? I have no clue. I don't get it. But he did it. And therefore, it was cursed, and that's how it was. The place, the place was destroyed and lifeless for the next 10 years. And then 20 years, and then 50 years, and then 100 years, and then 200 years, 500 years, which is now starting to be a long time. If I go back 500 years from today, we're going back to the year 1518. It's a long time for something to be destroyed, lifeless, and cursed. Well, 530 years later, some guy comes along, and he's looking at this place, and his name was Heel, and he was from Bethel. And he said, I know this place is messed up, but what a fantastic location. I am going to rebuild this city. And, and he decides that because of its location, because it's near the Jordan River, it's going to be a prosperous city. So he begins to rebuild it, and... and if you want to read what happens as he rebuilds it, you can look later in 1 Kings 16. But he starts to lay the foundations to rebuild Jericho. And all of a sudden, his oldest son dies, Abiram. Well, he keeps going anyway. He's a pretty determined guy. Wait, what did that curse say? Anybody rebuilds it? I mean, they're going to die. Their, their kids are going to die. He keeps rebuilding. Finally, he puts on the gates and he's finishing the city, and his youngest boy, Sagob, dies. To which we might say, well, it was under a curse. What did you expect? But 500 and some years later, this city is rebuilt, and it's back in action, but there was still something messed up about it, still something not right about it, because there was something about the water. It was poisonous somehow. It could even kill you. In the land, it never grew anything. So how are you supposed to live in a city if you can't grow food and the water is bad? This was the situation of the city. And the city was a hopeless, hopeless case. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. How are we supposed to live here now all these years later? In a, in a city which is sick and dead. And, and, and it's such a mess, messed up place because it's under a curse. And, and, and they're saying, we, we want to live here, but we have this curse to deal with and we don't know what to do when it's so messed up. A person's life can look like this too. I remember a conversation I had with somebody and it really stuck in my head afterwards, actually for a long time. Because I was talking with this woman who was in an abusive relationship and she was at, at Bodensehof. And, and she was explaining what her abusive relationship was like. Her boyfriend treated her like garbage. He was unsupportive. He didn't care about her. He used her for everything he could use her for. And practically everything he said to her was degrading and hurtful. He was also physically abusive. And everything that he said and did had an underlying message of you 
are worthless, you are stupid, and nobody would ever want you except me, and the only reason I want you is so I can use you. So, as she described this, I thought, what a terrible situation. And it made me angry and sad at the same time. But the reason she was talking to me, and this came out then a little bit later in the conversation, was that she had been given an incredible opportunity handed to her on a silver platter to come out of this relationship and go start life fresh. And, and basically what had happened was there's a family who'd heard about her situation, knew what was going on, and they said, she needs to get out of this. This is horrible. And so they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to basically set up a new life for you on the other side of the country. You're going to cut, we will pay your plane tickets to fly to this part of the country. We will, we will organize a place for you to live. We've got a job lined up for you, a very good job. And we'll, we'll kind of make you a part of our family while you get settled. There's a church here that's really great. And you can just basically get out of this abusive relationship and start life fresh, like witness protection program style. And I was listening to this, I thought, this is amazing. What, a, what an incredible family that would see that happening and offer to do that, right? And I'm thinking, yes, you can get out. You can be free. You can live again. You can heal. You can begin to discover how valuable and wonderful you are. And, 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 and she just was like, yeah, that's why I wanted to talk to you. Um, I'm wondering if you think it's a good idea. I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course it's a good idea. This is a fantastic idea. And, and we talked a little bit longer, and, and she said, you know, thanks for this conversation. This has really helped me. Um, I'm going to stay with my abusive boyfriend. And I thought, why? And, and she said, you know, the more I talk about this, the more I realize, uh, actually, he loves me. And he needs me. And all that abuse, I mean, that's just how it is. That's not going to change. I better just learn to deal with it because I'm sure no other relationship would be any better. And, and I remember thinking, how can this be? And at the time, that was the first conversation like that I'd had, but actually I've had many since. I've had many since, and, and it's like she chose to live under a curse. She had the opportunity to get out, but she chose to live under it, and I thought, why would a person do that? But then I started to realize, I actually do the same thing. Because if you live under a type of curse in your life, for a long time, you start to get used to it, and it starts to feel like it would be impossible to come out of it, and it becomes very easy to adopt this mentality, well, that's just how it is. I guess I'll deal with it. And anyway, how would you come out from something like that? What if the curse has been spoken at you, has been spit at you, and been beaten into you for most of your life? You probably believe it anyway. You're worthless. There's no hope for you. You know, you'll always have this problem. And what if you're always saying the same stuff to yourself? What if your parents were messed up and, you, and they were under, and, and it's like this curse too? What if it's generational? What if it's huge? It's next to impossible to come out from under a curse like that, isn't it? Or is it? Well, it turns out there's a hint of an answer that comes from a story about a very similar woman to the one I described that happened a little while earlier in this same city. And it's the story of Rahab. And you probably remember this story because at the beginning of this whole Jericho scenario, Joshua actually sends his spies to check out Jericho because they're thinking of attacking it. They want to know how tough they are. And so he sends these two guys on a reconnaissance mission. And it says in Joshua 2.1 that Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Okay, why were they lodging there? I don't know. 
Um, historical narrative, they did. But we also know something about Rahab. Uh, when, she, when they said that they went to the house of Rahab, this is not her private home. This, and it's not a hotel. She was running a brothel. And from some historical information that I, I, I read about it, it would seem very likely that this was a very successful brothel. She had big business and was a famous prostitute. And kind of sobering to me as I, as I think about her story is the fact that everything about her life seemed to revolve around this sex area and seemed to revolve around what she was doing because even her name related to sex. And in the common vernacular of the day, everybody knew what the word Rahab meant. The word Rahab, the best way we could translate that in today's language would just be slut. Schlampe, if you speak German. <laughs> That's the best way we could translate it. And so this is a story about Rahab the slut. And, and I can't imagine what it would be like to have that written over your life from the time you were a little person. Who knows how it really worked out? But if somebody speaks that over your life, you are a slut. That is going to have an effect on you. And, 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 and when her parents named her that, or however she got that name, it's almost like they condemned her or doomed her to being a prostitute. So her life, just like the city she was living in later, was totally hopeless. And it was like her life was under a curse. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you, that this woman was broken in the area of her sexuality from the time she was old enough to even know what sexuality was. How would it be to walk through your village and have people saying, hey, slut, as a young girl. Hey, whore, what are you doing tonight? Well, here she is years later running a whorehouse what did we expect? It's an impossible situation. And yet, something happens. Years later, she hears, probably from her customers, about the God of Israel, and in the midst of her mess, she decides to bank on him. And that turned out to be a game changer. Just that one thing, banking on the living God. And it was actually simple. She didn't stop being a prostitute. She didn't start having new quiet times. And she didn't go to, no, she simply believed. God saves. God saves. And if anyone can break the curse, he can break the curse. And so she decides, because she's banking on the living God, to hide those spies from the king. And in return, when the army attacks, they spare her life. And, and, and when the Israelites attacked, every person in the city was killed, men, women, and children, except Rahab and her relatives. And when the army attacked, she was in her house, and the sign that she had made with the spies so they knew to save her was she hung a scarlet cord out her window. And when they saw that, they knew this is the one we save, which blows my mind because... <laughs> Honestly, uh, in the world of prostitution, at that time, the scarlet cord hanging out the window was the sign that you were open for business. That was an advertisement for new customers, for prostitutes. But this time it was different. This time she hangs the scarlet cord out, out, out the window after she puts her faith in God, and, and it becomes a symbol of salvation. And that, because that's what God's like. And... and you know what else he did, which is incredible? After this whole ordeal was over, Rahab went and she lived with the Israelites. And after a while, she even got married. She met and, and she married this guy named Solomon, and, and, and they had a boy named Boaz. And he had children, Obed, and grandchildren, Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David, King David to be exact. 
And of course, from his line of descendants came Jesus. Talk about redemption. A woman who's given the name slut, broken in the area of her sexuality, a professional prostitute was saved, but not only was her life saved, God took especially this area of brokenness, her sexuality, and turned it into something miraculous and beautiful and wonderful. Yes! God used Rahab's sexuality to bring Jesus indirectly. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we, have, we read what some people call the Faith Hall of Fame. And the author of Hebrews, he talks about all these examples of faith in the Bible, and he lists one after the next. And there's this example of Abraham, yes, faith. Isaac, yes, incredible faith. Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, what? Rahab the slut? No. Rahab the champion of faith. That's crazy. No, that's not crazy. That's God. That is normal for him. And if that's what's happening with this woman in this city, maybe it's not next to impossible to come out from under a curse. Maybe he can take a curse and a hopeless situation and reverse it. Well, let's fast forward back to this city after it's been under a curse for 500 years, how do we get rid of the curse? Well, in this case, Elisha does something pretty interesting. And it's, it's the first main thing, I would say, there's some other stuff that happened, but the first main thing that God uses his life to do after Elijah is gone. And, and how does he deal with the curse? Well, we can read it right here, 2 Kings chapter 2, Verse 20 to 22. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, thus says the Lord, I've healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day according to the word that Elisha spoke. I don't know about you, but I was expecting a little bit more than that. You know, here we go. New bowl with salt. And how are we going to get rid of this curse? Let's go down to the river. Just take a little salt and um, problem solved. We're done. The curse is broken, everything's taken care of, you can live here, no problem, you're good to go. I was expecting something more dramatic. You gotta be kidding me. You can't break a curse that's hundreds of years long, that's a symbol of destruction and lifelessness with a little salt. You can't break something that's wrapped in darkness with a pinch of salt. You're telling me the entire thing is just that easy? Just that easy, a pinch of salt? Is that really the game changer? Yeah, if you're dealing with a curse, apparently there's something to be said for a new bowl with salt in it. <laughs> Does it have to be difficult to come out from living under a curse? Maybe not. Maybe it can be easy and instantaneous. And, and before we take a look at the message of the salt, I, I just... I just want to pause for a minute because as we've looked at or talked about curses, real or figurative, that represent hopeless situations, hopeless situations, excuse me, it could be that for some of you something comes directly into mind. Because some of us live with situations that feel hopeless. And, and, and maybe there's a situation in your life right now that feels hopeless. There's an ongoing sin. You just never get out of it. Ongoing sin. Maybe there's an event. Maybe there's a habit. Maybe there's a medical problem. Or maybe something's been written over your life 
that just plain feels like a curse. Some of you will not have something like that. But some of us do. And so I want to just take 30 seconds, and you don't have to probe the depths of your life. If you feel like you're living with something that's over and over again, the same situation, it just feels like a curse, and it feels hopeless, you'll know exactly what it is. Because it's often the thing that you're saying, I don't know how I'd ever get out. If there's something that comes to mind, I'd encourage you to write it down. And we'll just take a second, 30 seconds, just to think, write it down, and we'll come back to it. What's the deal with the salt? I mean, for us, salt's just a thing. Put it on your steak. But for these people, and in the ancient Near East, salt was a symbol that had a lot of meaning. And in the ancient world, people viewed salt as something that was incorruptible and everlasting. And because of that, salt was often used symbolically when people made covenants or covenant agreements. And and the picture was, I use this salt as an agreement, uh, sorry, as a symbol that our agreement is incorruptible and everlasting. So if I'm entering a covenant with you, I want it to be incorruptible, everlasting. The salt is the symbol of it. But even more than that, God had had said that salt was associated with his character and his covenants. And you see this already in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. I put it in the NLT because it's a little bit easier to get. God had told his people, season all your grain offerings with salt to remind you of God's eternal covenant. Never forget to add salt to your grain offerings. Remember salt, he said. Never forget. Salt's a symbol of the eternal covenant. So in the Old Testament, when we're considering in the ancient Near East, the meaning of salt, salt is associated with covenant. And now because of this story, there's an additional association to this picture. Salt is associated with covenant, which means good by curse. Somehow, the incorruptible character and covenant of God is the solution. And so what we need is a new bowl with salt. A new bowl filled with covenant stuff. We got a curse? We need a new bowl with covenant stuff. New, a new covenant. <laughs> Which... It's kind of interesting, all the way back in 2 Kings, because knowing what we know, that's a remarkable connection. Because we also know that our hope is a new covenant with the same God. A new covenant that cures the curse. And there is a curse. And this new covenant cures the curse, yes, For a slut. It's big enough to cure the curse for a slut, but it's also big enough to cure the curse for a whole city. And not only is it big enough to cure the curse for a city, it's big enough to cure the curse for all people, including you and I, because the new covenant even kills the power and the curse of sin and death. And it does it once and for all. And when we celebrate communion, we read in Luke 22... He took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they'd eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the blood 
of Jesus that this symbol points to is bigger and it's better than the salt that Elisha put in the river because one pinch of salt in the river killed the curse for a city. But for those of us who belong to Christ, the blood of Jesus puts the power to the end of every single curse, every hopeless situation. How fast? Instantly. And how long? Forever. So in Christ... There are no more hopeless situations. We never, ever, ever have to live under the power of a curse. Never. As a child of God, we don't have to live under the power of a curse. It doesn't matter where the curse came from. Maybe it even came from a follower of God, like Joshua. Spoke garbage into your life. Well, amen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how much damage it's done. It doesn't matter how long it's been going on. In Christ, we are free, and we don't have to live under its power anymore. In fact, as we read in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. And the power of this blessing and this covenant is so unbelievably big and permeates our being so completely that it actually makes you and I into the salt in this world. You're the salt of the earth. What is that supposed to mean? Will you become the blessing to bring hope in the lives of others who feel cursed? What does this look like? For me, um, this guy, Nick Wojcic, is a guy who, who exemplifies this reality. And maybe you know who he is, maybe you don't. I didn't know who he was until I'm in a church service one evening. And uh, I came into this church service, and they started with a little video of testimony of Nick Vujicic. And I had a bad attitude on this evening. So I come into the church service all sarcastic. And and, uh, (laughs) then they start showing this video of Nick Vujicic. And I didn't know anything about him. So all I see is they, they just show a picture, you know, of his face. And here's this guy who's smiling and saying how wonderful Jesus is. And yes, giving his testimony. I love Jesus. Jesus is so wonderful. And here I am sitting in the back of the service going, oh, please. Just another smiling, happy Christian telling us how wonderful Jesus is. Thanks, but no thanks. Right now, I'm not in the mood. And just as I was settling into my really rotten attitude, they changed the camera angle so that I knew then that Nick Vujicic is a person who is born without arms and without legs. And I was like, oh, not just another smiling, happy Christian telling us how wonderful Jesus is. And, and it kind of shocked me because I realized that this testimony um, is not what I thought it was. And one of the things he said in that testimony, which I will never forget, is he said this. He said, I'm not a man without arms and legs. I'm a child of God. And and I thought, that is incredible. That blew me away. His identity is so set in Christ that something as substantial as having no arms and no legs didn't define him. He said, I'm a child of God. That's what defines me. There are no more hopeless situations for me. And and he he kind of reminds me of a person who was a a friend of ours and a friend of Bodensale. This woman's name was Pushel. And some of you may know who she is. But she was this incredible woman, young woman, who is working in orphanages in South America and, and, I don't know, 23 years old or something like that, she gets diagnosed with cancer. And you're thinking, how could, how, could she, how could she get cancer? When you hang out with Pushel, it's like hanging out with Jesus. And this wasn't just cancer. This was the most long, drawn-out, miserable cancer. And over years, she wrestled with pain as her body just decayed and, and, and oh, 
it was, it was awful. Morphine didn't even begin to help with some of the stuff that she dealt with pain-wise. And you'd think, well, then she's just this miserable person who's just suffering. And, and, and she was suffering, but that's never the impression you got when you talk to her. Because every time you talk to her, she was just a joy. And in the last part of her life, she's up in the place that she lived, in mecklenburg vorpommern And she said, you know, bring some girls from the street. Bring some girls from the street. I'm going to have a Bible study with them because these girls don't have anything, anything. They don't have anyone. Nobody cares. And so she started meeting with these girls. She's lying on a gurney in her house and can't move. And everybody's saying, well, we need to minister to her. No, she's ministering to other people because she wasn't doomed. This cancer did not have power to steal her life. Life flowed out of her until the minute she died. And so the curse had no power. And, and the truth is, if I'm in Christ, I'm free, I'm forgiven, I'm accepted, I'm loved, I'm a part of an adventure in the kingdom of heaven laid out specifically for us by God himself that can't be stopped by my circumstances, even if I don't have arms and legs. That would be the biggest curse in the world for some of us. But the truth is, pain cannot get in the way of the forgiveness and freedom and life of Christ that's available to us. Failure can't. Tragedy can't. Uh, my sin can't. Even my own sin cannot get in the way of the freedom, forgiveness, love, and, and adventure that's available in Christ. The only thing that can get in the way of this is actually unbelief. I'm just a failure. No, you're not. I mean, in your flesh, sure. But you have a new identity. In Christ, you're forgiven and free. You're a beloved child of God. And, and, and the flesh and the curse are there. Yes, that's true. But the power is broken in Christ. Why would you choose to identify with your flesh? Why would you choose to identify with the curse? Well, because I'm tainted. I'm tainted because of abuse. And I can't undo the effects that it's had in my life. And I'm tainted because of the sin that I've been involved in. And I can't undo the effects that it's done in my life. And I'm beyond repair because of my past and my background. I can never, I'm never going to really heal. What are you talking about? That's not true. You're not tainted. You are as white as snow. There is no cause for shame. In fact, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. Free. Yeah, but I'm too shy and I'm too afraid and I'm always freaking out and it's who I am. And, and I'm just arrogant and I just don't have real friends. And God never speaks to me. And I'm not smart enough and I don't get it and I'm not spiritual enough and I'm actually just a petty jerk. That's who I am. And, and I'll always struggle with this. And I'm always going to be miserable. And I'll probably never actually have freedom and joy in my heart. And God never seems to do anything in my life. He never does. Other people, yes. Not me. No. 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 Stop it. That's a lie. If you are in Christ... No curse can stand. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. All of the promises of God find their yes in Jesus, and in fact, in him we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Why would you choose to identify with the curse, Steve? Why would you choose to identify with the flesh? That's tragic. The curse is broken. I'm not a man with no arms and no legs. I am a child of God. So substitute your own curse here. I'm not a man with depression. I'm not a man with a medical problem. I'm not a man with anxiety. I'm not a man who struggles with sexual sin. I'm not a man who's undisciplined. Substitute your curse there. I am a child of God. And you might say, yeah, Steve, that is called denial, my friend. <laughs> and denial is not just a river in Egypt. That is straight. Listen, 
Let me tell you this. You are a guy. Yeah. You are a guy. You are a guy who's undisciplined. You are a guy who struggles with sexual sin. You are a guy with medical problems. You are living in denial, Steve. You better believe I am. I'm always living in denial when it comes to identity. I can deny my flesh or I can deny Christ. I pick. And you're also always living in denial when it comes to identity. You get to deny Christ or you get to deny your flesh. But for those of us in this room who feel like we've been living under a curse, and you'll know this because you have an internal language that goes like this, well, I'm just stupid, a failure, miserable, weak, tainted, beyond repair, entrenched in sin. I'm just this. And I'm not good enough, and I'm not smart enough, and I'm not strong enough, I'm not disciplined enough, I'm not nice enough, and I never have enough what I need, social skill, money, I don't have enough opportunities, motivation, I don't have enough willpower, not enough discipline, not enough desire. And some of us, you'll know because you live in the world of can'ts and nevers, and it's like inside, it's, I can't do it, and I can't get out of it, and I can't make it, and it never works, and it never happens, and it never pans out, and it never goes away. If you, like me, have struggled with that, the curse, there's good news for us. It's the gospel. All you need is a little salt. An incorruptible, eternal connection to someone who has the power to set us free from the law of sin and death. And this is exactly what we have in Christ. And the salt tells us, this is the message of the salt from this first event, a city where no one can live. The message of the salt tells us that if you get in covenant with the living God, the curse is dead. And you know what? Life may be hard and painful, but in Christ, and it will be, we can expect trouble. But in Christ, we have everything we need to live well, and we have everything we need to live with him for eternity. We have a, a new identity, and we have, in Christ, a living hope. And I'll tell you this, it's going to sound too good to be true, but it is true. Our hope in Christ is bigger than any circumstance, and it's bigger than any of my sins. And so our hope is bigger than addiction, it's bigger than pride, it's bigger than porn, it's bigger than greed, and it's bigger than fear. Our hope in Christ is bigger than divorce, it's bigger than abuse, and it's bigger than depression. Our hope in Christ is bigger than cancer, it's bigger than MS, ALS, and it's even bigger than not having any arms or legs. Our hope is even bigger than death. Because the scriptures tell us that death is like a bee that was buzzing around and stings somebody. Stinger is in you, and now the de it can't sting you anymore. So what's a bee that has no stinger? It's a pain. It's annoying. But it has no power. That's death. Even the power of the sin and death is gone. And so as we live, we could, like Paul, say this, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even ourselves. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, 2 Corinthians 5, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new is come. And so, my friends, Rahab is not a slut. Nick Vujicic is not a man with no arms and no legs. Pushel was not a girl who had terminal cancer. And I, Steve Voley, am not a guy who is stupid and worthless. What about you? No pain or circumstance can get in the way of the life, freedom, forgiveness, love, and adventure in Christ. The only thing that can get in the way is unbelief. 
And I've found out I, I can't just increase my belief. Maybe you've tried. I'm going to believe more. I can't do that. It doesn't work. But I can choose which reality I look at. That I have a choice. And there's a truth, and we'll end with this, there's a truth that for me, very practically, has been incredibly helpful in turning this whole story and symbol and picture into reality in my life. And the truth is this. Whatever you look at and focus on gets bigger in your eyes. Whatever you focus on and fix your eyes on and dwell on gets bigger. And, and, and here's the thing. If I focus on my flesh and who I am in my flesh, flesh that's just going to get bigger and bigger. And here's something that you've got to know. You will never get freedom from something that you focus on. Never. Never. You'll never get freedom from something that you focus on. And, and this is some way we hurt each other. Well, you know, what's my, I've got back problems and this is my thing and I just need to get rid of the back problems and I wish no back problems and pray about the back problems and get rid of back problems, back problems, back problems, back problems, back problems. The only thing I see is back problems. Well, there's a little bit more in my life than back problems, but I'm focusing on that and that becomes the biggest thing in my life. And we do this with each other with sin, don't we? You know, how many conversations we had in the dorm at different times or wherever. Uh, oh, I have a problem with porn. Porn! We'll help you. Uh, terrible. Uh, let's uh, meet and talk about porn and why we shouldn't look at it. And then we're going to get software about the porn, and then we're going to avoid the porn, and then we're going to have accountability groups about the porn, we're going to pray about the porn, and just whatever you do, no porn, and just no computer porn, and just and all of a sudden, we think we're helping each other. The only thing we see is what we're focusing on. And the hope in Christ is not to focus on the flesh and try and improve it. The hope in Christ is not to flat focus on the old identity and try and make it better. The hope in Christ is to focus on the new reality. The curse is dead and give our attention to Christ. And the truth is that if we belong to him, who I am in Christ is more real than who I am in the flesh. And the spiritual reality of Christ is bigger than the physical reality of my experience. The salt tells us, in him, the curse is dead. And Father, I want to ask that you would help us to believe this. And that we would be people who increasingly appropriate in our lives the freedom the blessing, the power that you've given in releasing us from the law of sin and death, in, in, in becoming a curse for us. And Father, we want to be people who see ourselves as people who belong to you, children of God, and, and, and who live in the same way that Nick Wojcic shows us, practically, not allowing all of these external things of our flesh to define us, but living in the freedom that comes from what you've done for us. And so I'd ask that we'd be people who don't regard each other according to the flesh, looking at other people. You're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. And that we don't regard ourselves according to the flesh. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. But that we would live in the goodness of being a new creation. In your name, Jesus. Amen.